It's a digital music trance coverage of uh, South by Southwest. Uh, this is the first day of music, really, and uh, it's uh, a pleasure to have on the show Emmanuel Zuns, uh, CEO of the company One RPM. So, hi, Emmanuel. Thanks for joining me on the show. How's it going today? It's going well. Thanks for having me. Uh, so let's talk about the company. You know, uh, I, I usually like to start at the beginning and, and, and talk about how the company started out and, and uh, when. Sure. Um, well, we launched uh, in 2010 and uh, we had a focus already on Brazil as our first launch market. Yeah. So I went down in 2010, in July of 2010, to launch the business in Brazil because I knew that um, there was a large market opportunity in that country. Um, and so we just really built it from, you know, in a grassroots manner. Yeah. Um, we wanted to launch in the U.S., but we decided that it was better for us to start off in a, in a new market. Yeah. Uh, and I have considerable background with Brazil, so I knew, I know the language, and so I knew I could go down there and do something. I understand uh, the culture. Uh, so really started in 2010, but before uh, I had 1RPM, you know, I had a, a, a small record label that also focused on Brazilian music. Okay, great. Uh, that started in 2006. The idea started in 2005, but the company actually launched in 2006 when I was in New York. And uh, we had a few successful releases. And so from, from that point, I understood a little bit what the market in Brazil needed because I was focused on working with those Brazilian artists. Um, but I was, I've always been in New York, so uh, we had an understanding of you know, what was going on in the U.S. and learning from the companies that were successful in the U.S. and applying some of what they had done in the U.S. into new markets like Brazil. Yeah, of course. And, and it's interesting to look at, you know, starting a company uh, that works in music distribution in Brazil because, of course, there's going to be some things that are different in terms of, like, uh, both how people purchase music and in terms of how artists, uh, you know, are used to distributing it. Of course, there's different levels of, of, of uh, tech literacy, I think, uh, in different countries. So how do you find the experience in Brazil? Yeah, there's a lot of differences. Um, and, you know, one of the things, um, and I think it's not just Brazil, I would say all Latin America kind of suffers from a lack of knowledge of the tools that are out there. The, the markets in, in, in some of these emerging markets, whether it's Latin America or other parts of the world, are significantly behind what's happening in the U.S. or in Europe. And hence, that's why there's an opportunity. Uh, at the same time, you have an incredible music scene in these countries with just rich, rich cultural backgrounds and incredible music that just blows blows me away every time. And that's that's very exciting because we love music. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and you have the dynamics of the market, emerging market economies that are growing as well. Whereas, you know, the U.S. economy or the European economy are somewhat stagnant right now. You have markets like Brazil where it's huge growth because, you know, they're finally really starting to come into their own, whether it's technology, entrepreneurship, uh, you know, increased spending uh, power that they didn't have before, the more, middle, more of a middle class. So all these things together, you know, combine, make it into an interesting uh, time to be working in these markets. But at the, on the flip side of that, there's they were ignored for so long, the artists in the industry was ignored for so long that a lot of artists don't understand how to navigate the digital landscape, how to release music in this new environment. They still feel a lot of times that you know, maybe getting a record deal is the best way to go. They don't know how to do DIY, do it yourself very well. So the trick in these markets is to educate very much at like what you know the pioneers of DIY and digital distribution did 14, 15 years ago here in the U.S. Yeah. Companies like CD Baby have always been very good at educating comp uh, you know their artists, and so we're trying to uh, you know take some of those lessons from those you know first companies that came onto the scene and apply some of those practices. But it's not a formula, you know. It's yeah. it's because each market has its own. A formula, or not formula, but each has its own way to achieve success. And so, what worked in the United States may not necessarily work in Brazil. You have to understand the cultural context uh, for these for that market. And so, given our background and our expertise in that market, we're able to take what what was successful in the U.S. or in Europe and other markets, but apply them in a in a way that is unique to the market that we're operating in. Yeah, sure. And you're talking about sort of uh, you know the artist perspective and from a consumer standpoint. Do you think that almost because of you know the the rival smartphones and you know consumers being pretty tech savvy with you know around the world, maybe the consumers were actually ahead of the bands in in the way they were thinking and adopting music consumption? Um, 
I'm not sure if that's true. I think that, um, you know, for so long in these markets, there were no real services or stores to buy music from. So what happened is that, uh, you know, people would buy a lot on the mobile phones because that was the only place to buy. So that in that way, yes, you know, there's a high level of mobile consumption in, in Latin America. And that's actually really good, uh, much higher than what's in the U.S. Also, the mobile penetration is higher in Brazil and Latin America than it is in the U.S., at least in Brazil, than it is in the U.S. There's um, more people have mobile phones in Brazil than they do in the U.S., surprisingly. Um, but on the other hand, because there were no services, no platforms to, del- to really sell or deliver music to, um, most people didn't buy music. You know, they would download it from free sharing sites, free mar- you know, file sharing sites like RapidShare or ForShared. And that became the norm of digital distribution. How am I going to launch my music? Well, I'm going to put it on this site for free. and Everybody can download it. And I don't know who's downloading my music. I don't know what's, you know, I don't retain control over that process. And I think that's a significant problem right now for those markets. And, uh, you know, you guys leverage the, the power of social media. Of course, you know, Facebook uh, being quite popular. Um, in Brazil as well, uh, by creating a widget where our, you know people can actually purchase music uh, right away pretty pretty easily from Facebook. So how did how did that uh, idea come about, and how did the execution uh, look to you in terms of like reaction uh, by the fans, and, and how many tracks you are actually able to sell? Yeah, you know uh, it's interesting because the the Facebook app, you know, we have U.S. artists that use it as well. We have big U.S. artists that use it as or relatively big, I'm not talking about superstars, but we have you know artists with a significant fan base in the United States and, and, and as well as in Brazil that using this application to sell music on Facebook. And people aren't really buying music on Facebook right now, whether it's in the US or in Brazil. Uh, if you offer it for free, then they're more apt to download it. Um, and we, we have a mechanism which you know requires an email address and it's, it's actually really simple because it's, uh, it's using Facebook Connect. So we pull the email address from the Facebook. <laughs> they don't, excuse me, they don't have to type anything. And uh, that actually is working out really well um, because for us, you know, we, because we're a platform that is for artists, but we also have a place for fans. We're getting a lot of fans signing up to our service. And then we understand what their tastes are, right? And so we can then recommend music to those fans who have downloaded music for free on the Facebook app, we can then recommend later music that they might want to buy, whether it's on iTunes, we give them the link to iTunes to buy. So if, in that sense, it's very useful. Um, and I think people really like our Facebook app, um, but it's not making money, but it's helping in other ways. And in, in not only in the US or in Brazil, but everywhere. So I think it's, it's, it's more of a, it's not so much of whether people want to buy it because they're in Brazil or in the US. I think it's it's an issue of selling on Facebook. I don't think Facebook is a, has become an e-commerce platform. And I'm not sure it ever will be at this point. You know, it's been several years that people have tried to be tried to sell stuff on Facebook. People don't want to buy stuff on Facebook. That's not their choice. Yeah. Sure. And uh, uh, talking about, uh, you know, the, the, the plan of, you know, the company and, and the way it operates in terms of, of a business, it's got a quite interesting setup in the sense that there are no yearly charges. There's a one-off setup fee for, for an album. And uh, and and then you take 15% of the top on, on, on the on the on the royalties that are, that are generated. So, uh, how did you come up with that strategy, and and how do you feel that that differentiates you from the, from the rest of the of the distribution companies? Yeah, you know, there's uh, we the type of company that we want to be, and that we are, but that we want to continue to be as we grow, is we want to be a company that's really working in partnership with the artists. Hence, we want to have a vested interest in whether they're selling music or not. Uh, the other way to go is, you know, have an annual fee and then you don't take a commission off the sales. But I don't know if that aligns our incentives with the incentives of the artists. So we really want to be a partner with the artist success. And that means that, okay, if it sells, we get a cut. But we also, if it starts to sell, we pay more attention and then we try to promote it more. So there's a whole aspect of the marketing that comes into it, and that's that's because we're really passionate about music. There are other services out there that are fine, and there are good services that don't take any cut off your sales, but they also aren't going to help you in the marketing. They're not going to be there for you. It's just a strictly a delivery service, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I think at the end of the day, the artist has to make a choice as to what kind of service they want. Do they want a service where they have, you know, they can they have some engagement engagement with their with their distribution company that they can rely on, that they know that the incentives are aligned? 
or do they just want, you know, I, I know by myself I can sell a million units. I don't want to share anything with you guys because I'll make more money that way. And that's, that's a choice. At the end of the day, we think that our value by promoting artists, even if they're already selling on their own, but for us to also help with that, whether it's getting them a feature on iTunes or getting them something on RDO or Spotify or whatever, I mean, we feel that that really adds value and, and you know, we need to get paid for that. So, um, so I think we, that's just kind of the, our philosophy and that's why we want to make money. Um, but you know, it, it, we, we rely on digital music sales to make money. And we make money off the fees because there's a process, there's a cost to us, there's some artists that don't sell and we, we need to charge up front. Um, and we're always looking for new ways to make money. Um, we're, we're, we're actively working on YouTube now as a really good money maker for us. Uh, we have the, uh, the ability to, to monetize all the videos on YouTube that are using our music, which is really interesting. Uh, we're also doing channel management where we actually manage the artist channels on YouTube, but it allows us to place higher premium advertising alongside their videos. So the artists make a lot more money that way because we have a special deal where we can, you know, we can get better ads. So there's, you know, we're looking into sync licensing. There's all kinds of other things that we're doing, but the, the basic business is distribution and selling units. Yeah, and how do you feel about, um, you know, still image videos and lyric videos? You know, I know a lot of people are recommending artists to put those up on YouTube uh, to increase views and, and generate uh, some extra cash because actually people do, do, do view a lot of those. Uh, yeah. So do, do you encourage your artists to do that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because, um, you know, YouTube is the largest music service in the world right now, you know, unofficially. But even though I think they're planning on doing something more official, I'm not sure if that's a good idea or not. I don't, I don't really know enough about what they're trying to do. But the fact of the matter is, is that I think it's something like 40% of all music traffic is on YouTube. It's really impressive. And it's open to everybody. And what we like about YouTube is that it is free for the fans, pretty much. It's ad supported, but it's free to the fans. But artists can, can do really well on YouTube if they know how to use the services. The thing is, it's actually quite complicated to understand how to maximize YouTube's potential. And so a lot of people, uh, and there are different types of partnership you know, structures. So just because you have a YouTube partnership doesn't, you don't have the content ID that we have, you don't get the premium channel, uh, premium advertising that we have. So I think, you know, we feel we can add a lot of value to artists by doing that. And that's a big focus for our business right now. And talking about, uh, you know, you're talking about partner relationships with uh, services like iTunes, uh, Spotify, Audio. Uh, how are you finding those? You know, I know that uh, a lot of those uh, features and everything that comes with that come from uh, fairly personal relationships. Uh, yeah. And uh, a lot of those companies don't have huge numbers of, of staff. Uh, so how do you find dealing with them? And, and is it relatively easy to get in touch with them and talk to them about your artists? For the most part, it depends on the platform, right? There are some platforms that we have amazing relationships with and they become, you know, we really push a lot of our features to them because we know we can get a good feature with them. It does come down to relationships. It also comes down to quality of the music. You know, they, they trust us to recommend good music to them. So, um, you know, we're careful in not abusing that relationship. They're like, oh, you got to do this, you got to do that. You know, it's, it's, we always only give stuff that we really believe in. So, but I think for the most part, I mean, they're very open to it. It's their job to to open new listeners to new music, you know? So they want us to recommend stuff to them, you know? So it's that's why I think that, you know, digital music distribution is so important because even if you're not really selling a lot initially, is if you're a young artist, a new artist, um, the opportunities that you have to work, to, to get heard and to get your music heard to so many more listeners through services like RDO or Spotify or Deezer and even iTunes, um, I mean, it's great because they, they open up millions of new listeners and you might have a new track and nobody's ever heard of you, but because of our relationship and because we believe in you as an artist and we say, hey, Deezer or RDO, listen to this really cool track, this is a new artist completely unheard of, these services are, are willing to promote you. They're and, and they kind of want to break artists. Like I think it's uh, uh, from a, uh, a streaming service standpoint. I think it's a point of honor for them to be able to demonstrate that they can actually break an artist from from scratch. I think so. I think that all of these people who work in these companies, these music service co music companies, I think that all, um, a whole lot of them are very passionate about music. You know, otherwise they wouldn't be there. And I think at the at the end of the day, you know, there's the one business which is selling you know the pop stars and making sure they move a lot of units. But there's the other aspect, which is, you know, 
rooting for the underdog. And, you know, I think that's the best part of, the, of what I like to do is take an unheard artist who's got amazing potential and get them a feature. I think everybody's happy. Even if we're not making a lot of money off those artists, it makes us feel good about what we're doing. Of course. And I wanted to end by asking you about uh, the startup community. Of course, you've experienced uh, uh, the startup community both in New York, where you know, it's, it's exploding. And in the last six years, really, since the financial crisis, there have been so many startups that have come up and you know, a real community that has, has, has happened over there. I was just at the General Assembly event for the Made in New York uh, earlier this week. And... Uh, uh, and how does that compare to Brazil? Is there, you know, a, a strong uh, technology uh, startup community in, in, in Sao Paulo, or how, what's happening over there? Um, you know, I I think that the startup community in Sao Paulo is getting stronger. I'm not that familiar with it because I don't really live in Sao Paulo. I go there for three or four months out of the year, yeah. and I'm usually just focused on my business. But um, but I do get emails and stuff that I didn't get before about people getting meetups and informal meetups, the kind of stuff that we see in New York a lot now. Uh, I think uh, in New York, definitely, there's been a, you know, a real push for, uh, and, and, and I think the city supporting, you know, the new startup uh, community. There's a lot of um, uh, incubators and stuff. And, uh, you know, I benefited from going to New York in 2006. When I went to New York, well, I moved to New York in 2005, but I, in 2006, I won the business plan competition at NYU. That's, that's how I launched my first company. And I got so much support from the New York community. It was amazing, you know. So there's a lot. It's a small, small community still, but it's definitely very, very supportive. So I think in Sao Paulo, it's, it's, I have less to say about it because I don't know it as well, but I do see that there's a lot of... St- technology companies in Sao Paulo that are looking at the U.S. and saying that's a really cool idea. So, you know, when Groupon launched in the U.S., there started, we started getting copycat companies in Brazil. And um, when uh, Kickstarter became a huge success, we have now three or four Brazilian Kickstarters. So I don't, perhaps what I'm seeing is a lot of copycat companies, but they, they do a really good job. Yeah. Well, it was great talking to you, and I would recommend everybody to go and check out uh, onerpm.com and uh, see if, uh, and of course, if you're an artist and you need a distribution, go and check it out and see if that's uh, what, what you need. And thanks so much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you.